people are still joining, but uh, we have a lot of information to go through. So again, welcome. My name is Mike Pissarro. I'm the policy director of the Watershed Institute. Uh, and welcome to Lessons Learned in Stormwater Management for Minor Development. I'm going to introduce Corey Kreisiter. She's our stormwater specialist at the Watershed Institute. She works with green infrastructure, helping neighborhoods, individuals, as well as um, businesses and others uh, install, maintain, uh, and uh, design green infrastructure. Uh, Jim Purcell, he is the land use engineer for the municipality of Princeton. He is the one who has to implement uh, the minor development requirements for Princeton. Uh, Princeton had adopted an ordinance back in 2017, 2018, um, requiring stormwater management for minor developments, which in Princeton is over 400 square feet, and that was two gallons per square foot. Uh, so Jim has uh, had to uh, deal with that and having you know, implement that. So he's going to talk about sort of the lessons learned, things he's seen, and things that worked and did not work. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn it off. If you ever have questions, um, there is a Q and A button down the bottom bottom of your screen, as well as a chat button. Please put those in, and we will try to address questions as they come up. All right. With that, Corey, go ahead. All right, thank you so much, Mike, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, Jim and I are going to uh, present uh, on, on this topic to you, but what we were thinking we would do, it might help to move it along a little bit um, in a way that maybe makes more sense, is to have it more in a conversational style. So as I'm presenting, if there's something that comes up, um, like Mike said, feel free to go ahead and, and ask questions, but also Jim will be um, popping into the um, presentation as well to give comments um, as they come up. So thank you all again, and I'll go ahead and get started. So I am with the Watershed Institute, and our mission is keeping water clean, safe, and healthy, and we work to protect and restore our water and natural environment in central New Jersey through conservation, advocacy, science, and education. And we administer several statewide programs in New Jersey. And we are donor funded. So if you would like to make a donation, please do so at thewatershed.org. The strategies we follow are through scientific investigation, through research, monitoring, and GIS analysis. We also incorporate the stewardship practices of land management, water restoration, habitat restoration on our 950 acre reserve. And this is where a lot of my um, understanding and knowledge and lessons learned, which I, I'm not gonna be shy on. Um, we, there's been a lot of lessons learned. So I'll be presenting on some of those tonight. Um, and then also advocating for the protection and restoration of water and watersheds through municipal and state environmental regulations as well as a colossal amount of environmental education that's going on at our facility, or through our facility, I should say. And this is the agenda that we are going to be following tonight. Um, uh, although I have it noted at the end in red, um, it is something that uh, I am very passionate about. I feel like a lot of these facilities um, they, they work beautifully when they're maintained correctly. So if, if maintenance is not your thing or it's uh, you keep trying to figure out why do these facilities fail, it's maintenance. And I feel that it is, it is worth the cost to consider the two to three year maintenance agreement that should be attached to each one of these facilities. Well, just about each one of these facilities. And I will go over those tonight. But Again, this is the agenda. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started with why do we capture and filter out our stormwater? Um, there's a couple of different reasons, including trying to make sure that we do not flood ourselves or our neighbors. And these examples show typical issues, including flooded yards, unintended stormwater rivers going through our yards, um, flooded basements, flooded sewers and streets um, due to not capturing our stormwater. Like every drop that hits our property, we should be trying to capture. 
And stormwater is an extremely powerful force, as you can see in the pictures that um, are boxed in in the lower left-hand corner. This is a stream, a tributary that is in Princeton. It leads to Harry's Brook. And it's showing this, the same location um, in three different years. So on Google Earth in August of 2011, you can see what that stream bank looked like. And I, I, it's it probably eroded depending on where you're standing a foot or two deep. But then I, in May of 2017, I, you can, if you can see my cursor here, I was standing right over in this area where I, the cursor is pointing to, facing the street <clears throat> and took a picture. And I would say that the stream bank was eroded about three to four feet deep. But then by December of 2018, it had eroded quite a bit. It was probably more like six to eight feet deep. And my car is circled there um, in, the, in that picture. And it's located in the same area that that truck was located. So there's, there's been a drastic change in a short amount of time. So just to be able to see what's happened in a, the period of seven to eight years is, is quite dramatic. So it's definitely a force to be um, respected. But the other reasons that we, we need to capture and filter out our stormwater <clears throat> is to capture pollutants and sediments. And uh, this, um, the images on the left are showing non-point source pollution. And if, if you don't know, non-point source pollution is anything that we are not able to pinpoint the pollutant to. So for example, there may be industrial sources there may be surface runoff, tire and brake abrasion, dust, sediment, et cetera. The image in the center there is one that, that could have happened in our area too. It's just that particular image is of the Chesapeake Bay and it's after um, Tropical Storm Lee that happened in 2011. So it just shows you just how much sediment and pollutants ended up in the Chesapeake Bay. And like I said, I do have images similar to this from our watersheds in New Jersey. They're just not quite as dramatic and easy to see, which is why I'm using this one. Then we have point source pollution. And those are the three images on the far right-hand side. You can tell that pink stuff should not be in that stream and it's clearly coming from one location. Then we have, um, you know, uh, contaminants coming out of the pipe in the center picture, and that could probably be traced back to one particular low, uh, source. And then just the other day with our rainstorm, the picture on the um, bottom right there I took, and I have a video too of all that oil going straight into the um, storm grate. So you can tell where the, where the pollutant is coming from. So that's why that is called a point source pollution. So with regards to green infrastructure though, we know we need to capture our water to filter it and to slow it down and to get it to absorb into the ground. But where do we start? And we start with, with um, you know, our, our project is, is, is happening. We want, we want to add on or we want to build something brand new and we need to meet with an architect and or an engineer. And so we wanna to talk to them right away um, to say, where are we gonna send our stormwater? Uh, don't assume though that your architect, engineer or land, landscape professional understand green infrastructure. You definitely wanna ask them their knowledge. And if all else fails, reach out to us, ask, ask the watershed for help. Ask us for a list of either our watershed institute green infrastructure certified professionals or ask to have a meeting with us and we will definitely um, give help, guidance and um, some ideas as well. And, and Corey, if I may, the, uh, <clears throat> the professionals may actually know how to, how to do it, but not specifically how to do it in, in specific municipalities. We have seen very competent professionals who've done stormwater management in say Bergen County and, and get hired to do something in Princeton and are, 
are completely off base as to what we're looking for. So um, it is important to make sure that they're looking at the proper ordinances and they're contacting the municipal, you know, the municipal professionals to find out how things are done in those municipalities. Right, and that's a great point too. So thank you for pointing that out, Jim. I had not um, thought about that, but that is, that is um, a good point. So before we start this discussion, and, and since Jim Purcell is here representing Princeton, we want to point out that the recently adopted stormwater ordinance amendments there identifies the um, acceptable green infrastructure solutions in a loose priority order. Uh, Jim would like to point this out as the emphasis should be you be beyond using all of these or a combination of these before defaulting to a dry well. Um, yeah. the, important, the important thing there is the all. Um, we see sometimes applications that come in where um, the professional will say, well, I can't get it done with a grass swale. I can't get it done with a green roof. I can't get it done with any of the other systems. So I'm gonna do a dry well. And I have to remind them that it's not one or the other. It's can you do it with a grass swale that, go, that discharges to a small bioretention basin that eventually discharges through a vegetative filter strip before you start digging a hole in the ground and putting in a dry well. Um, I want to point out that our ordinance actually says the use of cisterns and dry wells is allowed only where the other listed methods cannot meet the requirements in this subsection. So you have to prove to me as the land use engineer that you've looked at managing your stormwater using one or, or a, a combination of these green infrastructure before you get to a cistern and dry well, because I will not approve it if you come to me and say, I'm putting in a dry well. So <clears throat> like I said, we'll be going through each one of these, but first I wanna start with where do you begin? And that's before you start your project. And this is an, ex an example of an expes expensive lesson learned. Um, before I get into it, I do want to give a caveat that this, this um, approximate 14,000 square foot addition um, of impervious surface, and that's everything that's highlighted in green, was done right at the times that the, right at the time that the rules changed for Princeton, where two gallons of stormwater were, were required to be captured. So I was called in to give some other options, and this plan shows you, like I said, what was going to be added. Uh, the homeowner asked us to come up with some ideas on how to mitigate the stormwater. So I worked using the plan that they already had. Um, so using the swales and everything that were already designed into it. Um, with those swales, we gave options to capture stormwater you, and, and showing how many gallons would be captured with each one. So we made, we, we created a whole bunch so that they could maybe, the homeowner and, and their architect or engineer could look at it and determine maybe which one or which a combination of which ones would work best for them. Now, the problem with this is that the design was already completed and that included a 53 page stormwater management report, including drainage calculations that were completed by the engineer and the design was, was done. The design by the architect was done. So a lot of money had already been invested in this project. Um, so unfortunately, the final, the final um, plan was to install a 40 by 40 foot by eight foot deep um, subsurface detention basin. And by the time I got there, it was already too late in the game. So um, had we been involved earlier in the planning process, uh, a lot of money could have been saved and, and we, things would have been done differently, but um, this is how the project ended up. And just, just to give you an idea of what a subsurface detention basin is, 
Um, th these are some examples of them. And although um, it does capture water, they are no longer consi considered green infrastructure at this point and would require a waiver or variance. Dry wells are, like Jim mentioned, um, are uh, very effective in storing uh, water to provide for both water quantity control and water quality, but they are intensive from a disturbance uh, perspective, requiring up to two and a half times the volume of an above ground system. Extensive excavation, removal of native soils and vegetation, and sometimes even uh, tree removal, and replacing soils with stone is, is not a very sustainable alternative. In addition, unless there is sufficient infiltration into the underlying soils, dry wells will fail. In areas of hydrologic soil group D, soils um, in, in hydrologic soil group D soils, uh, dry wells are not recommended. And after the first design storm event, they will fill up and there will be no capacity to treat the next storm. And therefore over, overflow will result and that runoff is now concentrated uh, flow from a single outlet where the pre-construction condition may have been sheet flow. Yeah, this is, uh, this is an example we see in Princeton a lot. <clears throat> Most of Princeton is as SHG D soils, <clears throat> which means that we don't have any uh, so any groundwater recharge taking place. Uh, there's no infiltration. Um, if, uh, if a dry well actually does um, take the water, the water is not infiltrating into the ground in, in a, it, it might eventually, but it's not doing it in a, uh, a rapid period of time. It really should discharge within 72 hours and we're not seeing that happen. What we are seeing is, is what Corey just described. <clears throat> After the first storm, it fills up. It's an underground <clears throat> basin um, that's permanently wet. The next storm comes along, it has nowhere to go. It tries to get into, well, it, normally we have pipes connected to the dry well. So it's, it's filling up the dry well even further. There's an outlet structure, the outlet structure overflows. And now we have a stream coming out of the outlet structure and probably going on to a neighbor's property and flooding that neighbor's property. Um, we have that happening in, <clears throat> in Princeton in a number of different places. Um, and we have to be innovative. <clears throat> we have to think about uh, even when we have these situations, can we somehow um, connect the outlets to another system um, or add in <clears throat> some vegetative filter strips before it passes over to another property or, or have it discharge into a rain garden. So we're working with all the property owners to find uh, alternative ways to treat it, even if they've already installed dry wells. Um, and Corey's been, uh, been wonderful on that, coming into Princeton to help property owners with their uh, na neighbors', neighbors uh, runoff coming onto their property and, and with the intensity uh, and, and uh, shorter duration of storms that we've been seeing. People's backyards are just flooding um, without having any offsite runoff anyway. Um, so um, we, are, we are really working hard to make sure that what we're doing is green infrastructure and, and not these, we, uh, I consider this a structural alternative, not a green infrastructure alternative. Although DEP will still call it green infrastructure. And, and just to point out too, Jim, this looking at these um, dry wells, if you consider maybe compare them to a rain barrel, they maybe they're 55 gallons. And if you if you figure out how much water is coming off of your roof, let's say you have a 400 square foot roof, and you multiply that by 0.6. The number I think that you come up with is um, 240, and that equates to approximately 240 gallons of water flow off of your 400 square foot roof in a one inch rainstorm. So if you've got a 55 gallon size dry well, 240 gallons, it's not gonna accommodate what you need in a one inch rainstorm. 
So besides the soils not perking, they're getting um, just overrun by water. And also, um, I've had homeowners who have called me out to their property saying, we have a, a water problem, it's stand, we have standing water here, or we have a stream that's just flowing through our yard when it rains. And we have a dry well, but it's constantly leaking, so I don't think it's working. So it seems to be something that it's just a default for people to go to is let's install a, a dry well. But then in the end, it's just frustrating for the homeowner because they think that they're doing what they're supposed to. And it's really money that's kind of been wasted in the long run. I've even had uh, contractors who've gotten permits to construct. And part of that was a dry well and had conversations with them that we have an alternative. And they will push back and say, but I have a permit. I'm allowed to do this. I said, yeah, you're allowed to do it. I can't stop you now that you have your permit, but I can save you money because now you don't have to dig this big hole and you don't have to get a concrete chamber to, or, or whatever you're using as your entry point into the stone and you don't have to haul all this stone in. Let's, let's work to do something different before you construct what you have in your permit. And we've been pretty successful with that. Um, finding an alternate uh, way. And, and of course, you've got to work with the property owner sometimes if the contractor is working with the property owner, but most of them would, most of them jump at the opportunity to save a little bit of money. So now we're going to move on to some of the um, BMPs that, uh, that DEP has listed that, that we like. Uh, and then lessons learned uh, from each one of them, just about each one of them. This is one where I don't really have a lesson learned, but of course I have a comment because I have lots of comments about them, but a grass swale. A grass swale is defined as a stable trapezoidal channel that is defined with, that is lined with turf. It is used to improve water quality and convey stormwater runoff. Grass swales do not rely on the permeability of the underlying soil for pollutant removal. Instead, pollutants are removed by settling and filtration through the grass. So um, to tell you the truth, I don't have a lesson learned with this one um, because I feel like it's kind of hard to screw up a ditch. Um, but I'm going to give my two cents, and that's that I feel that the, <coughs> these uh, swales should be native. Uh, not just typical turf grass, but they should have native grasses in it that are allowed to grow a little bit taller. Native grasses have um, long root systems. Some of them can be up to 10 feet long. And um, that helps with infiltration. They also, um, with a little bit taller grass, they'll capture sediments and pollutants and will slow water some as it flows through the system. So just something to consider. So therefore it would act, I think, somewhat like a vegetated filter as well as a grass swale. I'll give you, I'll give you a lesson learned. And, and actually, Corey, you, uh, the Watershed Institute had a great presentation on, um, on maintenance practices for green infrastructure a couple of months ago. <clears throat> Lessons learned is that you've got to make sure that the entry point for these grass swales don't get clogged with debris. Um, because that debris on a, on a quick, uh, uh, intense storm will just get washed into the swale. And, and you've got a maintenance uh, problem all, right off the bat. So that's one lesson we've learned from grass swales. Thank you, Jim. I wrote that down so I can take note <laughs> of it. Next, we have green roofs. A uh, green roof is defined as a vegetated roof. Um, it's covered with a growing medium. So the growing medium is what is in my hand in that picture, um, as well as the vegetation. The green roofs are effective in reducing the amount of stormwater runoff leaving the site, mitigating urban heat island effects and reducing local air pollution, as well as lowering energy costs by providing additional insulation. Now, we have a lot of lessons learned with green roofs and um, it's actually like, 
one of my most favorite um, gardens on the Watershed Institute. But um, this is what our green roof started out as. And when I started in 2017, I shouldn't say this is what started out as. I didn't see it when it was first installed in 2014, I believe it was. But this is what it looked like in 2017. And um, we, I, I didn't, I personally did not know how to maintain a green roof. Uh, so every time I pull out a weed, another weed would show up and it was just like, it seemed like within minutes, um, another weed was showing up with, with that heat um, up on the green roof, things move a little bit faster. So it'll start blooming about a month before everything else is blooming on the, um, on the ground. And then it starts to die back about a month before everything else starts to die back in the fall. But um, it just, we, we did have quite a bit of lessons learned with this. And once we got it under control, this is what it looked like. So last year it was spectacular. It looked like this. Uh, we have Roof Meadow um, maintain it three times a year. So they, they maintain it. I do go up there periodically just to check to see if we have any infestations with a particular type of weed. But basically um, after a couple of years of, of installing more plants and having their maintenance, this is what it looks like. It's important to have that healthy green roof so that it captures stormwater. And like, like I read um, to you, it, it um, mitigates the the urban heat island effect reduces the air pollution, lowers energy co costs, and then the plants also evapotranspire water. So um, it is important to have that green roof nice and healthy. And this is one of them that I would definitely say a maintenance contract is, is one you should really consider having. It's not, it's not necessarily a fun place to be weeding when it's 95 degrees out and there's no breeze. Uh, the other thing we have is pervious paving and that is um, a stormwater management facility that filters water runoff as it moves vertically through the system, either through infiltrating through the void spaces in the surface course or infiltrating through joints in paver units. So this shows a couple of different things here. Um, and, and one of the things I really wanna point out with um, pervious paving is that you make sure it's built right. The image on the left shows our grass paver cell system. And if you, if you don't know what that is, I put a little, um, a little example there just so you can see what it looks like underneath the turf. Um, the, note the yellow line on that image on the left indicates the edge of the grass paved system and where the turf grass starts. And you can actually see the difference in the two different uh, turfs. One is very spotty and doesn't look necessarily healthy and one looks healthy. And this is just, you know, this is not, um, a highly maintained turf. It's, it does have a lot of weeds in it. It's, you know, our environmental center. So um, the side that's closest to us um, has the grass pave and then it, it has, it's bordered there by an impervious asphalt path. But why is there a puddle? So um, just keep in mind that this, this system was built correctly. There's the stone storage that's underneath as required. Um, and then they put the cells on top, the grass paved cells, but then they backfilled it with the native soils. And the native soils are clay. So by doing that, they automatically removed the benefits of the storage underneath the system. So, um, I'm not a fan of the grass paved systems. I really haven't seen them um, functioning beautifully. I always see something similar to this. Uh, so I'm, unless, you know, unless there's a special circum circumstance, I'm, it's not one of my favorites. The image on the top right is a failing system. So when you have pervious pavement, you wanna make sure that you're not stockpiling 
soil, mulch, sand, or salt. I, I personally don't know what made this one fail. I, I took the picture of it. It was um, in um, it was in Maryland. I took the picture uh, recently. The um, the other thing that could have happened is maybe there was some erosion that was taking place around the facility and it ran down the street. If that is happening, you want to make sure that that erosion is stopped by either vegetating that or redirecting it. I'm not sure, um, but you want to make sure that you stop whatever is flowing onto that facility. These facilities should be vacuumed at least once a year. Um, so the, the, what I'm showing here in the lower right is an open, um, an open grade paver that's um, the brand name for that one is, is Pave Drain. Um, and then the one on top that's failing has the aggregate in between each one of the blocks. So um, it seems that maybe it would be easier to maintain the open grade um, facility as compared to the, the one that has aggregate. But I feel like if you, if you keep up with it, if it's installed correctly, then these should function just fine. Uh, but they do definitely need to have um, inspection periodically, just like all of these facilities do. They must be, um, you, you must make sure they're installed correctly, and then you must inspect them periodically, especially during and after a rainstorm to see if there's anything that's affecting it adversely so that it can be um, rectified sooner rather than later so that it's not an expensive fix. Because at this point, the one on the top right needs to be, as well as our own grass pave system, needs to be completely torn out and redone. So. Now, before we, uh, before yes. we move on from pervious paving, <clears throat> um, I do want to point out that pervious paving systems, um, as a best management practice, typically we're talking about a pervious pavement that <clears throat> filters the water into an underground um, retention system, um, a reservoir, if you will. <clears throat> um, th this gets back to HSG D, D soils where we don't get the infiltration rate. That doesn't mean that we can't use pervious pavement <clears throat> to do filtration, um, but you will need to create a reservoir that has an underdrain that then discharges, um, hopefully, to another green infrastructure system that filters it prior to it uh, discharging off the property. Um, we just had a very successful installation. I hope it's successful because it, we just finished construction at a, a property just up the street from our municipal building. <clears throat> I say it's going to be successful because I was there every day to make sure that the contractor did it right. So a little onus on me if it doesn't work. Um, but they weren't required to do this for stormwater management. Uh, they decided that they were gonna put in porous asphalt in the parking uh, stalls. Um, and they had a, <clears throat> a 12 inch deep um, stone reservoir underneath with a choker course and a and asphalt pavement on top and an underdrain system that then connected actually to our municipal system, which was how that site actually drained before they made the improvements. And this was an existing parking lot. So they were improving the parking lot drainage um, just by putting this in. Um, so just because you don't have the infiltration rate does not mean you can't use pervious pavers. Um, so keep that in mind as, a, as an alternate um, to, as one of the green infrastructure solutions to put in combination with others. Jim, not that this is gonna happen anytime soon and I don't know um, who, who, you're, um, pro who the property owner is that you're talking about, but how do we make sure in the future that that porous asphalt is not sealed? Um, they're going to have a, a maintenance agreement in place, um, at least for the first two years. Um, they have to put up a maintenance bond with, with us. It is a commercial property. So um, we, will, we will be monitoring that. Um, the property owner uh, has a, <clears throat> that we have a, 
um, maintenance plan that they have to file with us. And even if they sell it, the uh, maintenance plan has to be part of the transfer of ownership documents. So I mean, we, we do the best we can, but um, hopefully we catch the sealer since it's right up the street from the missile building. If I see a truck with, with pavement sealer driving into that property, I'm certainly gonna stop them. <clears throat> But you know, sometimes that happens. All right, Eric, thank you. I'm gonna jump in. There was a couple of questions in the chat and Jim, I think you answered this in the chat. Yeah, I've been answering some. Yeah, yeah but uh, one person asked for minor projects or pre-development infiltration tests required to ensure the 72 hour drain time requirement are met. So I believe you answered that yes. But. The answer is yes, and we and I've, we've actually been doing that since I came on board last July because <clears throat> I saw a lot of um, engineering site reviews coming in for uh, for additions and, and pools and patios of greater than 400 square feet, and they're they're at the time the immediate solution was let's put in a dry well, and I started asking the question, well, where's the soil test? Oh, we never require soil tests. Well, we do now. Um, so we built that into our ordinance as well to make sure that we have the proper infiltration rate. Um, it's, it's been a, an interesting nine months working with the engineering community in Princeton. Um, and they're all very cooperative and, and on board with making sure that we have the right information to put in the right, right systems. All right. Another question, green roofs usually not good as a retrofit, correct? Green roofs are difficult as retrofits, for, particularly from a structural standpoint. I mean, you really have to do a structural analysis of the building. If it is not constructed um, with, the, with a green roof in mind, the, the structure itself is, uh, may not be able to handle it. It is, it is a weight issue. All right. And then maintenance requirements are required for the minor development projects as well. <laughs> Yeah, and we, our ordinance just went into effect last month. <laughs> um, I'm not sure the property owners are going to be happy about it, but they have to provide us a maintenance plan. They have to report to us once a year and self-certify that they've actually maintained it in accordance with the maintenance plan. And that maintenance plan, even on a single family home, has to be part of the transfer of ownership documents. All right, thanks. All right. Um, somebody's going to somebody's gonna answer that question about the, the legal issue, I, I see. Yeah, I don't I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that one at the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, next we're going to move on to bioretention um, rain mm -hmm. gardens. So this one is uh, one that um, I definitely I'm going to focus in on quite a bit because it's it's the one that I have a lot of, of knowledge about. And I think that also it is um, the facility that most people are going to end up installing um, probably first um, before anything else, or at least as Jim was saying, having part of it as their treatment train. Maybe that's where um, discharge will take place from um, the underdrained facility of um, a pervious pavement. So, um, bioretentions uh, are uh, systems are vegetated stormwater management facilities that are used to remove a wide range of pollutants from land development sites. These pollutants include suspended solids, nutrients, metals, hydrocarbons, and bacteria, and they can handle sheet flow as well as concentrated flow. And this picture that I show you on the left is just a simple rain garden. It's only got um, two to three plant varieties that I can see in there. And the reason I point this out is because I feel that um, three to four plant varieties are about the threshold of varieties that you can put into a facility to be able to keep maintenance somewhat easy. Um, if a broadleaf weed showed up in this facility, it would be very easy for public works to be able to identify and remove. So um, just keep that in mind for three to four varieties at the max. 
So you want to make sure that your rain garden is built right. In order to understand if it's built right for the untrained eye, uh, you'll want to go out and observe the facility uh, during and after a rainstorm. And that doesn't mean that it's not built correct. It just may need some tweaking. And so in this particular um, case, the picture on the left, the top left, um, we're going to talk about, um, you know, it's holding water and it shouldn't be holding water. Um, the, the depth, the ponding depth of the rain garden was too deep and it's, it, there's clay on site. So according to the stormwater manual um, or the um, rain garden manual of New Jersey that's put out by Rutgers, uh, the soil depth of a rain garden usually ranges from three to eight inches. But a rain garden with clay soil should only be three inches deep. And when I say three inches deep, looking at the diagram on the lower right there, I'm talking about the ponding depth should only be three inches deep. So just to go back to that image on the top left, the ponding depth on this facility was more like eight inches deep. It could have even been deeper in some parts. So it wasn't draining. So what we needed to do was um, either, either you would install an underdrain or you would need to decrease the ponding depth, which is what happened. More uh, soil was added to it so that the ponding depth was raised to three inches so that it was no longer holding water after um, 48 hours. Now, the other thing you'll notice on the top right is there's a sediment plume. So if, if you see this um, flowing into the rain garden, what's gonna happen is after a while, it's gonna clog. And you, don't, you definitely don't want that to happen. It's gonna become a real issue. So if you see sediment early on, um, it indicates that there's erosion taking place uh, uphill from this facility, and you need to try and figure out where it's coming from. In this case, there was um, areas that just, just uphill from it that didn't have any grass on it, that the grass had started to die back. And this was now flowing into, it was now flowing into the facility. And um, so some uh, fast germinating um, fescue was installed to be able to stop that erosion. Um, this is an example of a clogged bioretention. So the question is now what do we do? And we need to figure out why it's clogged. So besides erosion or poorly stockpiled soil, mulch, or sand, one issue is that there's not enough sufficient pretreatment. Um, and you can spend a fortune on a pretreatment cell, which is it, like, like shown here in the top right-hand corner. You would need a vacuum truck to be able to suck that out. And that is um, something that was precast out of concrete. The other thing that you can do is just come up with a simple, um, cheap, easy way of pretreatment. And it looks like they just used, you know, some typical concrete um, landscape blocks and um, angled it to be able to capture that um, water before it flows into the uh, rain garden. And, and this way you can have somebody with a, a flat edge shovel just come in and scoop that sediment out and you don't need any kind of special equipment. The other thing you'll want to observe after a rainstorm is erosion. So uh, you can see on the left that there's erosion that's taking place and the erosion could be due to a few reasons. It could be because it's a new facility and the plants have not matured yet. It could be that there's not enough plants and there could also be a grade change and therefore more reinforcing is needed through the addition of either more plants or a check dam. In this case, this facility needs a check dam right where the mulch and the stone come together. 
Um, I also advocate for um, spending the extra money on buying extra plants and planting them denser. If you plant landscape plugs denser, then what will happen is they'll mature quicker and they'll, um, they'll squeeze out that open area where weeds can come in and take hold. So this is an, a, an image of our interns weeding our front rain garden last summer. And the main takeaway here, this is not what most rain gardens look like. Um, but what I'm, what I'm trying to show here is that um, when the, when the rain garden was installed, I don't know that it was planted as densely, um, but I do know that um, there were some open areas that weeds were able to take a foothold in, and there's a huge variety of plants. So it's very labor intensive. We have another rain garden that is, um, has three different types of plants in it, and literally it takes about 15 minutes a month to be able to maintain with maybe about a two hour cleanup at the most at the end of the season, because I'm just trying to make sure that crabgrass is not creeping in and therefore seeds are not taking over um, and, and spreading more crabgrass. So I'm just maybe a little bit more meticulous with that one. And that's why it's taking me longer, but um, we made sure that we planted that one extremely densely and in following years we went back when it looked like something had died off over the winter and had not survived um, or was was very weak looking just wasn't doing great we made sure that we um, got more plugs and planted that with uh, more plants just so that we could keep that um, vegetation really lush to be able to um, keep the weeds up the weed under the weeds under control. So infiltration basins are um, there are stormwater management systems constructed in areas of highly permeable soil that provide temporary storage of stormwater runoff and can help to reduce increases in both peak rate and total volume of runoff caused by land development. And we have a lot of basins of uh, these basins in New Jersey with low flow channels. Uh, this is a facility that more and more people are requesting to be naturalized, and they're, they're coming to us and, us and asking us how to do it. The image on the right shows an older facility that was naturalized by a, a property owner in Hopewell with the approval of their HOA and the borough. Um, and this, if you I feel like if you follow the same steps with these basins as you do, do with how I was describing vegetating the um, bioretention systems, they will do just as well. And I do know that um, this facility on the right, all they do is they cut it back once a year. So in the first two years, they did have some minor weeding and it was due to kind of historic um, um, thistle that was there. So that required some pulling. But after that, um, they said it's just about once a year that they mow it. And every once in a while, they need to go out and um, pull any kind of infestations. Maybe they're starting to, to show up. Now, sand filters. This one um, is a sand filter that is in Princeton. And it's a, uh, it is a stormwater management facility that uses sand to filter particles and particle bound constituents um, from stormwater runoff. Pollutant removal occurs in the sand bed. So th these, I, I do not have a lesson learned from this one. However, it would be super easy to weed it. You're gonna be able to see it right away. And I don't know, Jim, if you have any comments on this, um, well, it's not, it's not something you want in your backyard. Let's yeah. just, <laughs> um, so, you know, this is for a larger facility. Um, yeah, I, honestly, Corey, I don't even know where it is. Is it's it one at, of our parks? It's at um, Stone Church. Is that right, Mike? Stone Church? Yeah, Stone Church. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, just so, so a larger facility. Sorry, Mike. I, I was going to say just off Harringtown Road. Yeah. Okay. Nope. I'm going to have to go visit it. Since, since I've jumped in, a uh, couple questions. 
Um, yes, one one question. Someone put in triple shredded hardwood mulch is recommended for rain gardens. Uh, Corey, do you have an opinion? Is on that, that a question? That was a I statement was someone a statement. put. It is, yes, that triple shredded is good if that's um, what you're wanting to use because it doesn't float away as easily. All right. So um, we don't we haven't been using uh, mulch in our facilities. We've been using um, Nutripeat, which is the the leaf compost. Uh, and I know that Chris Abrupta is very um, he he feels that mulch is is fantastic and that it should be used. Um, we haven't though, we, we have been using the Nutripe and it's been, it, it, it has worked out just fine for us. So I think maybe what I need to do is a little experiment by getting some mulch. But if I, if I was going to use it, it definitely would be the triple shredded hardwood mulch. All right, um, question about the, um, use, using basement sump pump outflows draining into rain gardens. Um, some pumps into rain gardens are somewhat problematic because if they're running fairly frequently, the rain garden is supposed to dry out in between rain events. And the sump pump for some of these buildings is running like constantly, even in dry periods. So um, if, if the rain garden can't dry out, then you're gonna to start to have cattails develop. And um, in, in facilities that I have um, observed when prior to working for the watershed, I was in Fairfax, Virginia. And um, we did note that um, the sump pumps caused cattails and for the facilities to fail. Also there were, they at for a period of time they were installing rain gardens at the fire departments to be able to capture the water from the um, trucks being washed and those trucks are being washed constantly. So that kept the rain gardens wet too and that also caused them to fail. So I wouldn't advocate for it unless you don't have a sump pump that is extremely active. All right, and I get the last question, someone that wants to put in a small patio and rain garden, the landscapers talking about using sand with a glue between the pavers. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Did you say glue? Yep. I think he's talking about using paper set. Oh. You know, the, 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 the sand mixed with a, with a binder. Um, I, I, I don't know, you know, if the, if the patio itself is part of the stormwater management system, no, that's not a good idea. You wanna have open joints. But uh, if it's the, if it's just paper set between uh, the patio brick to keep it in place, it'll run off and, and run into the rain garden. That's fine. That's the paper sets, nothing more than a little bit of mortar. Is that it? Is that it, Mike? Uh, and there's another question. Are there ordinances or rules about uh, sump pumps flowing into rain gardens? So. I don't know whether or not we don't allow it. Um, if somebody was to come to us for approval to do it, we wouldn't allow it unless they could demonstrate, as Corey said, that the sump pump isn't running constantly. I, and I don't know any in Princeton that don't run 24 hours a day. Um, so we wouldn't, in Princeton at least, uh, and I know mine, and I live in Lawrence, mine runs 24 hours a day too. So I, I don't I don't know of anything that bans it, but we certainly wouldn't approve it. There we go. All right. Go ahead, Corey. Okay, thanks, Mike. Next is the vegetated filter. And a vegetated filter strip is a stable, evenly graded area that removes pollutants from stormwater runoff through filtration and biological uptake in order to provide pollutant treatment. Runoff must enter and move through the filter strip as sheet flow. Therefore, vegetated filter strips must have shallow enough slopes to maintain this flow condition. So these work really well alongside yards, parking lots, or driveways. And the image that I have on the left shows a filter strip next to a farm field that has corn in the background. 
And when the corn is not there, the filter does a great job of controlling erosion and capturing sediments. This particular um, picture was taken at Washington's Crossing Veterans Cemetery where just like everywhere else, um, maintenance is gonna be an issue. So if you, if you notice the, the grass that's in this um, filter strip is one type of grass. And I know that ecologically, there's not the diversity and everything. Um, it is a native grass, but those who, are, who have concerns about diversity, that is an issue, but maintenance is also an issue and getting that water absorbed is another issue. So in order to um, work with maintenance, it is easier if you have a monoculture there so that um, your public works or maintenance crew is able to identify when something has gotten into it that shouldn't be there. But this um, particular facility is only being cut once a year. So it's really um, a low maintenance thing and um, is really cutting down on the cost that would otherwise be there for needing to mow all of that. The other picture on the right is a facility at Rocky Brook Park in Heightstown. And it's capturing water from the parking lot. In order to keep it simple, we did the same thing. We know that Public Works is going to be maintaining it. So we just put in one type of grass and we put in um, one type of shrub, which I, if I recall correctly, it's, it's summer sweet. Um, and all of this can be mowed right back down to the ground. So if um, maintenance got in there and they accidentally mowed over the, the shrub, it would do just fine and would pop back. So just once a year, mowing it back and easily to easy to identify weeds that might creep in. Tori, what's the stone strip around the uh, opposite side of it? So the stone strip was just to be able to slow down water. It's on um, a slope that enters the facility and it continues in a gradual slope. So if you notice back, oh, where's my cursor? Okay, hello cursor, there it is. There it is. <laughs> right back here, mm -hmm. there is a storm drain. So everything is kind of um, sloped back to this area. So right. the stone was put there just to slow the water down if it came through too quickly so that it wouldn't erode out behind it. Okay. And, and these um, boulders were put in here so nobody would drive into it. <laughs> so. So it's, uh, a, it's, a it's a demonstration of how you can make something like this look nice on your, on your landscaping. So uh, most of these, uh, that's, that's another benefit is, is they're nice aesthetic landscape features that are almost forgettable uh, in, in what they're really meant to do. So, right. just a comment. <laughs> Next, we have cisterns. And these are just meant to capture and reuse stormwater runoff um, from clean roofs. Cisterns are ideal for harvesting rainwater for non-potable uses, vehicle washing, or toilet flushing. We at the watershed have two good-sized um, cisterns there that we use for flushing our toilets. The biggest issue with these is to ensure that you are drawing down the water in between rain events. So you want to um, make sure that, that they're empty, you know, in between by the time a new uh, rainstorm is coming. Um, they, most of these have pre-treatment filters, uh, rain barrels, I don't believe usually do, although I know that people have retrofitted them, but the larger ones have pre-treatment filters and it's important to keep those filters cleaned of um, leaves or grit from the roof or bird poop um, so that it, it continues to, to keep the water, or can keep, can excuse me, continues to keep the water clean that enters into the cistern and meaning clean, just that there's no debris that's in it. Um, rain barrels are often forgotten about and end up being a breeding ground for mosquitoes. So just make sure you have a screen over them 
and again, that they're emptied on a regular basis. And um, I think, I, think I, I just want to say it because I know somebody was asking why, why we're averse to <clears throat> dry wells and cisterns. And I put the emphasis on and, um, particularly for some of the reasons that Corey just pointed out. They do need to be emptied in between storms. Um, so the, in that way, they're similar to dry wells that fail. Um, they just fill up and, and there's nowhere for the next storm to go to. Um, and second of all, yes, the debris that does get in there, if there's not a good filter, um, will actually reduce the capacity of the, of the cistern. And that's a failure. Um, so we do not particularly like them if somebody wants to put them in. And even with rain barrels, we again want them connected to something else that is going to make sure that, that the, uh, they're, they're available for every design storm, not just the first one. And I'm going to um, hand it off to you, Jim, after this, but I, I do want to just point out again um, that it, it, it would be a good idea to consider a two to three year maintenance agreement for some of these facilities, especially that green roof and the um, rain garden. So if it's not something that, that you're going to be out there looking at after each rain event or really um, able to get out there and, and monitor for weeding, then please consider that, um, that maintenance agreement. Good point. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about doing the right thing. <clears throat> um, this is an actual uh, under construction right now project in Princeton. Uh, Richard Levine and Kathy Ailes own uh, these two pieces of property and they've consolidated them into one. Um, there were two houses on these properties. Um, they're living in one of them and they're going to demolish the next door house and put up an, an accessory dwelling which will have an apartment and some uh, exercise uh, room, uh, and a small indoor pool. It's a very nice facility. Um, but they, they wanted this accessory structure for their, uh, for their use. And uh, they also wanted to do their best to minimize the increase in impervious area, not because they were not they they were averse to meeting our stormwater requirements because I'll tell you in a minute that they did that and and more, um, just because they wanted to do it from a sustainable, environmentally sensitive way. Um, so they they actually came to us first with a plan that only had 390 additional. Um, square feet. Corey, if you could click the click the for the next right there, zoom in. Um, they actually came in and they the amount of additional impervious was below the 400 square feet. So they were not required to do any stormwater management under our ordinance. Um, we eventually, in reviewing the plan, we realized they had a zoning issue in that uh, in in this particular zone, you're not allowed to have two driveways on a single lot. Uh, unless the two driveways are connected. So um, they had two driveways uh, and the solution was to connect the two driveways and they chose to put in a ribbon driveway so that there are only uh, impervious areas under the wheel tracks. Um, but it kicked it over the requirement for stormwater management. It brought it to 711 additional square feet of impervious area. Um, Richard and Kathy, nevertheless, had always intended, intended on implementing green infrastructure, not only for runoff control, but just for the aesthetics of their landscaping. They wanted to make this, this new facility aesthetically pleasing to them and to the neighbors and to anybody that came to, the, came to visit. So Richard and Kathy hired Van Note Harvey Associates to design a, a comprehensive green infrastructure stormwater management system. Uh, included in the design are several green infrastructure elements, including two bioswales incorporating the bioretention media, a connected bioretention area next to, next to the new building, a 1,080 square foot green roof, and then on the, uh, to manage additional runoff, uh, stormwater runoff on the property where they're living in the house, uh, they added lawn inlets, a rain barrel to collect the roof runoff, 
and um, I think that's about it. Um, but they they integrated the grading somewhat so that the properties are um, together. Um, didn't get the name of the landscape architect. Richard and Kathy, Reed, it wasn't a landscape architect. This was Van Note Harvey Associates uh, is the engineering uh, team. Um, and, and in keeping with the sustainability of this, they are actually drilling geothermal wells um, to be incorporated into their projects. So they're gonna heat and cool their home through geothermal energy. Mm -hmm. um, Christine Yateman is the uh, design engineer for Van Note Harvey Associates. Um, she performed all the stormwater management analysis, identifying these separate drainage areas that you see on your screen. Uh, for each of the elements in the design, there's a separate drainage area. And she did uh, the calculations to demonstrate that for each of those areas, they could meet water quantity and water quality control to meet our ordinance. And, and again, most of this design was done before uh, we pointed out the zoning issue and they were doing the design even though they did not have to. Next slide, please. Um, then the landscape architectural drawings were drawn up and uh, unfortunately, these were not, these are done by the, the property owner using some stock information from a landscaper. Um, so I don't have a landscape architect per se, a professional that worked on it, but it is very professionally done. Uh, click again for this to zoom in. So they've identified in these plans specific, specific ground treatments uh, and the materials and, and the way that they want it graded. Um, and you'll notice that uh, the shading that's got the number five in it is their 1,080 square foot green roof that they're putting over what will be their indoor pool. Um, only in, not only in Princeton, but in sometimes in Princeton. And then the next slide will show you that they're all, they're, they've got a full landscape plan and you can zoom in on that as well with the next click. Um, full landscape plan with additional trees and shrub plantings. So this is an example of how um, integrated uh, uh, green infrastructure, stormwater management um, can be uh, your landscaping, your, your, your entire yard uh, in this case. It doesn't have to be your entire yard. If you have children, you obviously have, want to have play areas, but um, it's not that difficult to meet the requirements of stormwater management on your, on your individual property um, with these green infrastructure. Um, the next slide shows that they've, they've gone to the extent of showing details that show uh, things like the landscape cross section, click, the, and then the green roof is shown with their details of what they're going to be putting in. Um, they haven't identified here exactly what plants they're putting in, but as you can see, they're calling for native short root grasses, perennials, and plugs. Um, don't have a, a plant list for them, but um, when we do approve this, we will be making sure that they're not using, uh, they're not planting non-native or, or invasive species, that they are planting species that are compatible with rain gardens and, and green roofs. I can give some um, suggestions. Okay, I'll put them in <laughs> touch with you, Corey. Um, I know we have, we have a very good list of uh, plants that cannot be planted in Princeton. We have a do not plant list, which we adopted from the state of New Jersey. Um, and we are very sensitive to even plants that are not on the do not uh, plant list that may be invasive um, or non-native. Uh, we don't ban non-native species. Uh, in some instances, they make sense. So we have a municipal arborist who is very, um, very connected in, with all of the community and making sure that uh, he's not just an arborist, he's, he's got his landscaping hat on all the time, looking at what species are, are growing and making sure that uh, we, when we review plans that we're not allowing something to slip through. So um, one, of the, one of the lessons from this as well is that although um, all of this work required that, all of this work requires that existing vegetation, including 
some mature trees had to be removed. Um, but even though that was being done, that has to be done. Um, the, the end result is gonna be an attractive, sustainable yard that controls the stormwater to the best extent possible. Um, for, for folks who are on this uh, as, as um, um, yeah, as attendees, uh, if you're in the municipal field, as I am, if you're one of, one of like me, you will get phone calls. You will do expect phone calls when you see this extensive, what looks like extensive renovations being done. Um, we've already gotten phone calls about this specific project because uh, a number of trees uh, were removed. Um, and we get chastised all the time for allowing a property owner to cut down a big, beautiful tree. Um, in this particular case, all but one of the trees that was removed, and most of them were 40, 50 feet tall. They were very mature trees. Most all of them, except for one, uh, were diseased, were in decline, or were ash trees with, that were susceptible to the emerald ash borer. So um, just, just be pre prepared to uh, understand that the, the public is going to be asking questions uh, and that you need to be prepared to tell them that the work's being done in accordance with all the, all the ordinances, the permits that they have, um, and that it will enhance the drainage in your neighborhood. Be sure to re remember to say that, that part of the reason we're doing what we're doing is so that we are going to reduce stormwater flooding in your neighborhood um, and, and, and be proactive with, um, with that particular thing when, when you do get calls from citizens. Um, the citizen that one, one of the citizens that called on this one didn't even live in the neighborhood, happened to be walking her dog and saw the tree cutting and was livid with um, us allowing these, what, what she called 100 foot trees being cut down. Um, but, uh, you know, people have the right to do things on their property as long as they do it within within the ordinances and, and in this case, um, this is doing the right thing all the way. And that really is the end of my part of that doing the right thing lesson. I have a hundred stories on doing it the wrong way. Do we have other questions, Michael? There we go. Um, so you answered about the native uh, plants. So there's no requirement to use native plants, but you do have a do not plant list. Right. Um, I don't remember if you covered this, Jim, the name of the landscape architect that Richard and Kathy retained. Yeah, that, that was actually the engineering firm, Van Note Harvey okay. Associates. Yep. Good. Um, so the earlier question, so if you have some pumps, let's assume they're running quite frequently, and you won't allow a dry well, how do you deal with that? Um, well, in Princeton, we have uh, an ordinance that says that uh, any discharge, whether it be from a sump pump or your roof leaders, um, cannot discharge closer than 10 feet to a property line. So typically we work with property owners to find a solution. I had had one issue last fall where um, a sump pump was discharging perpendicular to his neighbor's property line. Neighbor called, I went out, got in touch with the property owner. It was a rental. So I, when I went out there, I spoke to the renters, um, but I got in touch with the property owner and I said, just connect another pipe to it and run it to your backyard. I'd prefer you run it out to the street. Um, in, in, in Princeton, it's not the ideal thing to do, but when you have a situation um, where you have no, no other choice, we will work with you to connect it to our municipal system. Uh, that particular property at the end of the driveway and just a little bit down the street, there was an inlet to our municipal uh, drainage system. Um, again, not the ideal thing to do, um, when we are dealing with, um, particularly in the central business district, and we're dealing with new renovations or a new home that might have to have a sump pump, 
um, we will just allow them to connect it directly to our drainage system as long as they're doing other stormwater management on site. Um, it's, it's a tricky situation. Um, and I know here in Lawrence, my own particular one connects to an underground four inch PVC pipe that's connected to three, at least three houses up the street that eventually connects to the catch basin in front of my house. <laughs> I don't know what to do about sump pumps. I'm, so I'm a little stumped about sump pumps. You know, if I could just note too, um, I've been called out to quite a few properties recently where um, the sump pump is running all the time or the neighbor's sump pump is running all the time and flooding the person downhill. And uh, there's hardly any trees to be seen in the yard, but their turf is magnificent. <laughs> so um, trees really absorb a lot of water or native plants really absorb a lot of water. And, and although I know it's not a, a surefire fix for everything, um, maybe considering shrinking down your, your yard a little bit and, and planting more native plants uh, would be another thing to just consider to, to test out and see if that'll, that'll help. I, I consider that a vegetated filter strip mm -hmm. between you and your, your next door neighbor. All right. Um, Peter mentioned much earlier that uh, there is a carbon footprint for installing dry wells. Um, concrete manufacture actually is a significant carbon footprint, but just all the equipment needed to dig and install uh, dry wells. So, you know, as we as a society are trying to address our carbon footprint, natural systems uh, will be a help on that. And, and, and I, I've said that quite often. I think I, dry wells, first of all, is a misnomer because in, in our town, it's, it's always wet, um, but the, the intensive, it, it, it's not at all a sustainable practice. I, I, I don't know how you can call it a sustainable practice in, in any shape, way. Yeah, or I, I argued against calling dry wells a green infrastructure, uh, but apparently I lost that argument since the rules got published with them in there. Uh, well, it would, <laughs> if, it's, if it's in a nice, coastal area where you get nice recharge of the groundwater, I'll, I'll give it that, but mm -hmm. not up here in the, in the uh, geological area yeah. we are. And then Tammy asked, what fast growing trees are good to plant along a drive to replace dying mature ash trees with uh, near intermittent overland stormwater flow, but also dries at times? Yeah, there's a couple um, that could be planted. Uh, honey locust is, is one. It handles wetter areas and over the driveway they don't drop um, sap and they have smaller leaves. So um, cleanup is a lot easier. There's um, willow oaks grow pretty yeah, fast. Oak. Yeah, also the same thing. It has smaller leaves, it does have acorns. So that's another consideration. Um, and I'm not sure about other ones at this point for fast growing, but those are, those are two that you can start with, but the willow oak do get quite massive. So it would be something to consider for their root system and everything. And I'm not sure how far back you're planting them from your driveway. Uh, so there was a couple questions, uh, about, sort of reducing the thresholds for major development or a minor development requirement and sort of how to go about doing that. Um, so we at the Watershed and several other environmental organizations uh, and Jack being one of them have been talking to municipalities about doing an enhanced stormwater management ordinance. Um, you can reach out to us, you can reach out to and Jack uh, to help you with that process. Part of it is education. Uh, you know, we did a series of meetings with the, you know, EC, town council, uh, and then the public in Princeton back, going back in 2016 and 17, leading up to their original adoption of enhanced stormwater management. And we continued sort of that process in Princeton when they redid the ordinance uh, last year. Um, when people understand the issues and understand the solutions aren't going to be so prohibitive as to prevent any development ever happening ever again. 
a lot of municipalities understand, you know, they know that their roads are flooding and roads that never flooded before are now flooding or roads that only flooded in the extreme storms are starting to flood more and more frequently. Um, all, you know, everyone is in favor of clean, clean water, you know, our streams not being dirty. Uh, and you, once you understand stormwater is actually polluted runoff, most people are in favor of trying to do what they can to address that. Uh, so a lot of that's education. Like I said, you can reach out to myself or, or our um, assistant policy director, Sophie. Uh, you can reach out to ANJAC or your local environmental or watershed group, uh, and they can help you walk through that process. Um, is there a recommended seed mix for infiltration basins? Is there a native grass mix? Uh, so, well, that's a good question. Um, and there are seed mixes out there. Um, Ernst Seeds is, is usually who I go through. They have a really good success rate with their seeds. I think it's like 85% viability, whereas other companies don't necessarily have that high of a percentage. Um, but their rain garden mix last I checked, um, which I'll admit was a, probably about this time last year, had 39 different species in it. And um, some of them get 12 feet tall. So um, I think it's, they, they, the, the reason they have so many in there is because they wanna make sure that no matter where you're using it, whether it's shady or sunny or extra wet or extra dry, that it's going to work out. But it's just too much variety, um, I feel. So if you were wanting to go with a seed mix, uh, there is, um, I, I think that we have it posted, a um, plant list on our website. Um, however, I, I, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't think I have it posted there yet. If you reach out to me, my email is there. I would be happy to help you come up with a seed mix and you could call and order one uh, specific for what you're looking for. Um, if there's a particular grass that you like, like say for example, uh, oh, um, I was hoping to keep sharing that, but um, Junkus that is, oh, I ended my presentation. Um, anyway, Junkus is a fantastic one if you look to see what kind of companion plants there are to go with Junkus, that would be a good way of trying to figure out what kind of plants you want to put in, but I would be happy to help you uh, if you um, feel free to email me and I'll, I, would, I would do that. And, and Rutgers University has a lot of uh, um, good information. Uh, while you were speaking, I just typed in Rutgers University Rain Garden Mix. And I have a PDF here about how to, how to a fact sheet for rain gardens and, and some links to um, some native plant information. And the last page is a Northeast Mid-Atlantic native plant suggestion for wet sites. Um, I can share my screen if you would like. No, oh, let me stop it. sharing so that you can do that. I think I can share my screen. Yeah, so that's what I would recommend is looking to see what, which plants appeal to you and then having a mix made for you. And I do know that Ernst does that. Uh, Pinelands has seeds that they also offer. So whichever one you're more partial to. Yeah, and I see Peter is, is pointing out that the New Jersey Do Not Plant list was not really intended for local implementation um, because it does not get down to the uh, variety level. Um, frankly, in Princeton, we don't care. There are plenty of alternatives. If, uh, if we're telling you not to put in a Japanese uh, maple, uh, go find something else. Uh, we haven't had any pushback. Um, and as I said, our at least in Princeton, our arborist is willing to work with any uh, landscaper and landscape architect to come up with the right, right mix of plants for any type of um, any type of project, from a single family home up to 
you know, multiple family housing in Princeton University. <laughs> but we get we give pushback to Princeton University as well on some of their plant selections. So cool. All right. Well, Jim, I think you have a planning board meeting to go to. Yeah, it's actually it's actually 7:30, so I have a few okay. minutes. Yeah. Um, I do have to change my shirt though. I'm not supposed <laughs> to wear a tie to the planning board meeting. So um, I will just quickly address the, there was the legal question. Uh, there's a case, uh, South Jersey Builders versus the borough of Haddonfield. Borough had a stormwater ordinance that required single family homes and duplexes, uh, even though they weren't going through the planning board process or the zoning board process to submit a stormwater plan to address their stormwater. Um, Borough of Haddonfield did not win, um, and actually our organization, as well as Sustainable Jersey, New Jersey Future, and Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions uh, joined, that law, joined the case on behalf of uh, Borough of Haddonfield to help. Uh, right now, the borough is seeking uh, that the New Jersey Supreme Court take a look at that case because that uh, we, we believe the appellate division didn't really understand the issues. Um, the, the borough wasn't requiring site plans and wasn't require you know a planning board they were requiring construction documents. Uh, that being said we did do a webinar and I put that in into the question and answer session back in December 2nd talking about why this really is not an issue for municipalities to go stronger. DEP's model ordinance, if you look at the preamble, all discusses the ability of municipalities and encourages municipalities to go stronger. Um, and also uh, the attorney, um, and I'm blanking on her name and I feel extremely bad, um, who was helping write this stormwater ordinance. Um, Our stormwater ordinance? Yes. Oh, uh, Lisa Maddox? Yes. Lisa was part of that webinar talking about the approach Princeton did. So not only did they ratchet it down in their uh, site uh, design requirements, their normal stormwater management requirements, but they also added a provision in their zoning code because municipalities have the ability to zone. That is not impacted by what's called the residential site improvement standards. So they put those sections in there um, the, and they called it large and small projects. They put that in the zoning code as a way to address the need to do stormwater management without running up against those concerns. Um, we could do another two, two hour webinar on why residential site improvement standards shouldn't be an issue to better stormwater management. Um, uh, and maybe if there's enough interest, we'll do that one again. But I did put a link into the, the last one we did. Um, and so that is, it is something to think about and design your ordinances to address it. Uh, but that should not be an impediment to go stronger. You said you put a link, but I don't see the link. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Let me go back to where I answered it. Oh, you put it in the chat. Okay. I didn't put it in the chat. I just put it where I answered the question. Oh, okay. So but it's I in the answer question the side of things. Got it. So everyone. Yeah, just so everybody can see that link, that would be good. There we go. So, all right. Uh, it's just Great. a little after seven. I don't know if there are other, any other questions. Think that was it. So, Jim, Corey, thank, thank you for you inviting me. Much. I greatly You're appreciate welcome. this. Uh, again, you, the recording of this and the slides will be sent out to the attendees uh, and made available uh, probably be in the next couple days. Uh, so, you will get that. So, if you've registered, you will get a link. All right. So, again, Jim, Corey, thank you very much. Everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Okay. Good night, all. Thank you.